So we are going to talk about the characteristic polynomial of a matrix using fx modules. So let's suppose we have some finite dimensional fx module m, then we can write it as isomorphic to a direct sum of cyclic modules. And let's suppose this direct sum over here is described by fn a, where a is in rational canonical form. You can check the link in the description for an explanation of that. In that case, we can write a in a very specific form. Along the diagonal, we're going to have 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. This is going to continue. And then at the very end, we're going to have negative a0, negative a1, dot, 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 all the way to negative a d minus 1, where d is the degree of f of x. Now, in reality, a is not just one of these blocks. It's going to be a block matrix where we have a bunch of these down the diagonal, but I'll leave just considering one of these blocks for now. The purpose of the characteristic polynomial is to relate some properties of this matrix with the properties of the corresponding fx module. So let's first define what we mean by the characteristic polynomial. So the characteristic polynomial of a module m we can write as the product of f of x. And these f of x's are all of these things in the quotients of the components in this direct sum. So this is over all of those components in the module m. And we're going to show that this is related to a very important property of the matrix A over here. In order to do that, we're going to ask what is the determinant of lambda i minus a, where lambda is a formal variable. In order to do this, we're going to first look at a particular matrix that's going to show up a lot when we compute this determinant. So we're just going to do it first. It's going to look like this, negative 1 lambda, negative 1 lambda, negative 1 lambda, and so on, all the way down. So this is an n by n matrix. Let's say it's a square matrix of length n where we have negative ones along the diagonal and lambdas right above the diagonal on the super diagonal. In this case, what we're going to do is show this determinant is negative one to the power of n. It's not very difficult to show this because the point of this matrix is everything where I haven't written anything, there are zeros. So first thing we can do is expand along the first column. Well, we're going to have negative one times the determinant of this inside here. And then everything else is just going to be zero, so that cancels out. On the inside matrix here, we do negative one times the determinant of the rest of this, negative one times, and so on. So if we keep doing that all the way down, of course, there are n of those when we keep doing the expansion. So we're going to get negative one to the n. So now that we've proved this little lemma over here, let's take a look at the main determinant. We want the determinant of lambda i minus a, where a is this matrix. So if we see what that looks like, this whole determinant here, we're going to look at along the diagonal, these zeros are going to become lambdas. So we're going to have lambda, lambda, lambda along the diagonal. And then over here, because we're subtracting a, all of the ones are going to turn into minus ones. And then all of these negatives are going to become positives. And then this last one down here, this is going to become lambda plus a d minus 1. Now the idea here is that we're going to expand along the top row. So let's see what happens when we do that. First of all, we're going to get lambda times this determinant in here. So that's going to look like lambda, negative 1, lambda, negative 1, and so on. We're going to have lambda plus a d minus 1 here. And then all of this is going to stay the same except the a0 gets chopped off, so we have an a1 at the top. And then if we go all the way over here, starting from here, the length of this matrix is from 0 to d minus 1, that's d. So traversing all the way over, that takes us d minus 1 steps. So if we think about the cofactor expansion formula, we're going to get a negative 1 to the d minus 1 out in front. And then we multiply that by the determinant of this whole thing in here. Notice if we start from this negative 1, go down, 
it's going to be negative one lambda, negative one lambda, negative one lambda, dot, dot, dot. And then this last column, if we take out the last column, because that's where the A0 is, then we're going to keep going down. It'll be lambda negative one as the last thing here. And then this part's going to get multiplied by A0, just like this part got multiplied by lambda. Now, we already did this determinant. That's what we did at the beginning. So the size of this matrix, because we took out one of the columns, one of the rows, it's going to be the size of the original matrix, which is D minus one. So the size of this matrix is D minus one. Therefore, this determinant is negative one to the D minus one. If we multiply that by the other negative one to the D minus one, those are going to cancel out. And so we're just left with the A zero out here. So you can take all of this out and it's just going to be plus a zero. Now, what does this matrix look like? If you look at this matrix, it's actually exactly the same as this one. It's in the same form, except we have one less coefficient here. We're starting at a one instead of a zero, but we have the same form, lambda negative one, lambda negative one, and so on, coefficients over here. So we can apply the exact same process to this matrix in here. This thing is going to be lambda times the, the same determinant, except lambda negative one. We're going to start at a two over here, lambda plus a d minus one. And then this is going to be plus this time a one instead of a zero. So we can think about applying this recursively and look at what expression we get as a result. So if we think about what this expression is going to look like, Let's write it starting with the A0 so that we can kind of see what's going on a little easier. We're going to have A0 plus lambda times this determinant. Now this determinant we just showed is A1 plus lambda times this determinant. Of course, we keep going. This determinant is A2 plus lambda times blah, blah, blah all the way until we get to the bottom right corner. And then that one by one determinant is just a D minus one plus lambda. And the question is, is this polynomial, once we expand everything out, is this going to be something that we recognize? Well, let's think about what these terms are going to be because everything inside here is multiplied by a lambda. So the constant term is just going to be a zero. So we know this constant term. We have a linear factor of a one and everything in here is going to have two lambdas. So this is the only linear part, a one lambda. After that, by the same reasoning, a two is the only quadratic part. And then we're going to have a three lambda cubed and so on. We go all the way through here. Eventually, we're going to get to a d minus two lambda to the d minus two. And then in here, a d minus one lambda to the d minus one. And then this last factor of lambda in here, we're going to have d instances of this lambda because this is a d by d matrix. So we multiply all the lambdas along the diagonal. We're going to have d of those lambda to the D right here. So do we recognize this polynomial? Of course we do, because by definition, when we're looking at this rational canonical form, this function F of X is defined to be a zero plus a one X plus a two X squared. And then all the way down plus X to the D. So this is actually the polynomial F of X, except we're using lambda as the variable instead. So this part is actually F of lambda. And this is only for the determinant of one of the blocks. But in the rational canonical form, we have all of these blocks going down the diagonal. So when we take the determinant, we can actually just multiply the determinant of each of the blocks. Well, each of the blocks is going to have determinant F of lambda. So if we multiply all of them, we're going to have the product of f of lambda for all of the functions in that module m. And so what this is telling us is that if we have a module where the matrix is in rational canonical form, then the product of f of x is equal to the determinant 
of x times i minus a. So that gives us a way to calculate this product of all of the functions given only the matrix in rational canonical form. So now we know that this equation is true if the matrix A is in rational canonical form. But obviously most matrices are not in rational canonical form, so what are we going to do then? We need to prove some identities about similarity. So first of all, notice that if we have any matrix P, then PI P inverse, of course, because the identity doesn't do anything, this is just equal to I. And if we put a lambda in the middle, p times lambda i times p inverse, that's also going to equal lambda i, because we can always pull out scalars when we're doing matrix multiplication. As a result of this, let's suppose we look at the determinant of lambda i minus p a p inverse. So this same determinant here, except instead of a, we have p a p inverse. Well, we can write lambda i right here as p lambda i p inverse. And now we can actually factor this because we can write it as the determinant of p times lambda i minus a times p inverse. Because we can write this with the p and the p inverse, we take one out on the left, we take one out on the right, and then that gives us the lambda i minus a in the middle. But we know the determinant of a times b is the same as the determinant of a times the determinant of b. So in this case, we're going to have the determinant of p times the determinant of lambda i minus a times the determinant of p inverse. But the determinant of p is going to cancel with the determinant of p inverse. Those two have to multiply to 1 because p p inverse is the identity. So we can actually ignore these and we just get the determinant of lambda i minus a. So what this is telling us is that the determinant of lambda i minus p a p inverse is equal to the determinant of lambda i minus a. Now for any matrix that's similar to a, we can write that matrix as p a p inverse. In other words, if two matrices are similar, then the determinant of lambda i minus a, that's going to be the same for both matrices. So let's suppose that we have some matrix B which is similar to A. In that case, we know that the modules FnB and FnA are isomorphic. You can check the video in the description for an explanation of that. So let's think about what is the product in, let's call this module n, the module with b, what is the product of f of x for this matrix? Well, because these two are isomorphic, they're going to have the same quotients here in the direct sum. That's how an isomorphism works. So these two are going to have the same f of x's. So the product in n is going to be the same as the product in m. Now we know the matrix A, suppose that one is in rational canonical form, because we know every matrix is similar to one rational canonical form matrix. In that case, this one we just proved is equal to the determinant of xi minus a. That's what we showed at the beginning. In rational canonical form, we have this equation. But we also know b and a are similar if these are isomorphic modules. And if they're similar, then the determinant of xi minus a equals the determinant of xi minus b. That's what we just showed. So here's what we're concluding. The product of f of x of these factors over the module with b is equal to the determinant of xi minus b. The point here is that this characteristic polynomial equation, this is not only true if we're in rational canonical form, it's true for every fx module. Because we can go through the rational canonical form since those two matrices are similar, 
and show that this determinant is equal to the product of the factors in the module for B. So for any matrix, the characteristic polynomial of that matrix is going to give us information about the factors in the FX module. So we showed in the previous video that every matrix is similar to some matrix that's in rational canonical form. But in general, it might seem like it's pretty difficult to figure out what is the rational canonical form of a specific matrix. Well, one of the things that we need to know in order to get that rational canonical form is we need to know the elementary divisors because the rational canonical form is talking about the FX module when we write it as this direct sum of cyclic modules. For an arbitrary matrix, it might seem very difficult to say, well, what are the elementary divisors of this matrix if we express it as a direct sum of cyclic modules? That's not a very easy thing to see at first. But in fact, if we take this determinant, it's going to give us a polynomial, that's actually the product of all of the elementary divisors. So for any matrix in any form we want, we can figure out the elementary divisors by taking this determinant. And that's the power of the characteristic polynomial.